I haven't seen such a flagrant uh, uh, re uh, disrespect of the principle of non-interference, as it is uh, in the case of now Georgia or in the case of uh, Ukraine. Can you imagine uh, uh, a Russian politician uh, going to Estonia and speaking, uh, uh, speaking about the, uh, 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 Estonia joining Russia, not NATO, and, and so on. You can't imagine. But if it comes from the West with good intentions, so to promote democracy, uh, as the president of Estonia said, uh, also that Georgians have the complete right to choose the European future, but not any other future, only European <laughs> future. And this is maybe the right moment to switch to the second part of our interview. And everybody, I'm still talking to Rain Millerson, Professor Rain Millerson, uh, who used to be an emeritus professor at Tallinn University until the university uh, cancelled his status for like uh, participating in a conference in Russia. And uh, Professor Millerson wrote, as he said in the first part of the interview, a lot of articles and analysis on uh, Russia and Ukraine, but also on the development of international law and the international system. And I really consider his writings on par with those of uh, people like uh, Professor John Mearsheimer. They are realist and they try to look at what is happening on the ground and then how that impacts the different actors uh, from their from their perspective without actually uh, giving cover to one or the other. And I would like to point out maybe his most important uh, or most one of the most insightful articles, although I must say I haven't read all of his articles, but he wrote one in 2014. Uh, shortly after the Maidan events, this article was published in April 2014 on Ukraine as a victim of geopolitics. In If you read that today, 10 years later, it is very prophetic uh, in, a, in a way of the picture that you draw. Um, that is drawn in there about the the constant escalation between Russia and, and Ukraine, but how this escalation is also fueled by the by Moscow's, by Russia's experiences of what NATO did, especially uh, in 1999 with the bombings of uh, Yugoslavia and then the way that Kosovo was split away from Yugoslavia and Serbia. And Professor Müllerson, you um, you your analysis, as you said in the first part, is that none of both sides, neither NATO nor Russia, are innocent of transgressions of international law. Could you maybe uh, expand on that a bit? I mean, who transgresses on who transgressed on international law in the ping pong between these two actors? Uh, it, it is a very interesting uh, and important uh, uh, question. Uh, First, maybe I will say, uh, you mentioned the article uh, which was published in 2014 in uh, one of the Oxford University Press uh, journals. Uh, uh, it was uh, well received uh, then and even more after, 19, uh, after 2022. Uh, so the article was uh, uh, taken up and I participated in a conference uh, in March uh, 22 in Germany, where, where, when my article was discussed, uh, this um, article of uh, 2014 and uh, the events which uh, followed the, the uh, Russian invasion had already uh, started. Maybe first about this article, this interesting and probably this uh, characterizes my writings uh, also. It was published, as you mentioned, in spring uh, um, uh, 2014, but in January 2015, I was in Mexico. Uh, I was invited by the university and I lectured there. And one evening I had a call from the foreign minister of Mexico and the minister invited me to have tea uh, late at night. Uh, and I went, of course, I, uh, 
it, it was very i was even intrigued um, uh, how did he know that i was in mexico i was uh, simply a professor of Tallinn university at that time i didn't have any po uh, uh, a post uh, <clears throat> and uh, uh, but when I arrived there and uh, we had a conversation and then I asked uh, him and he told that one of his um, uh, aides or advisors, a lawyer, had uh, read this uh, article. Uh, this was Jose Antonio Mead. Uh, the, uh, later he was a presidential candidate uh, even. And uh, he had uh, uh, one of his uh, assistants had uh, read uh, my article, a lawyer, he was a lawyer, and had recommended this article. And uh, as the minister said, that I was like Mexico, a non-aligned mm -hmm. in my article. So, so therefore, it, it, for me, it was a really uh, uh, very nice to hear uh, that uh, I was non-aligned. It is very difficult to be... Uh, uh, non-aligned, certainly uh, uh, practically impossible uh, uh, to be uh, uh, non-aligned in Estonia. M maybe it may be easier in other uh, Western parts of Western Europe, let's uh, put it uh, in uh, uh, such a way. Uh, uh, now, uh, about international law. Uh, I have written about it, I have thought a lot about uh, it, uh, and uh, I have uh, uh, later I found these uh, historical uh, sources that uh, in international law there has to be something which is comparable to domestic law laws or legal systems uh, in uh, uh, let's say democracies at least is uh, the separation of powers. If uh, one power, executive usually, uh, or other powers become uh, too powerful, uh, then uh, uh, the, the rule of law state uh, or uh, democracy uh, becomes uh, at least very distorted is, uh, if it uh, uh, doesn't disappear. So <clears throat> there should be separation of powers. And in uh, international relations, uh, this is the balance of uh, powers. And uh, though during the Cold War period, which was not very good, uh, the bipolar world uh, uh, was not uh, uh, very conducive to the development of international law, but nevertheless there was a balance of powers between the East and the West the Soviet Union and uh, the United States and their respective uh, allies. And um, your famous countryman, Emeric Vattel, wrote already, uh, it was in uh, probably uh, uh, in the 80s. Uh, yeah. Oh, uh, I don't remember exactly when uh, it was written, uh, his uh, famous uh, Trois de Jean, uh, the, which is uh, the uh, uh, law of uh, nations, uh, uh, I would say uh, now, which is, was about uh, international law. And he wrote about uh, the foundation of international law. What is the foundation uh, of international law? It is uh, the famous equilibrium of powers, um, he uh, wrote there. And uh, later also, uh, uh, several famous international lawyers uh, like, uh, uh, like uh, uh, Oppenheim uh, in uh, the, the UK uh, wrote also about uh, the balance of powers uh, as one of the foundations of international law. And this is exactly what disappeared um, uh, when the Soviet Union collapsed. And uh, there is a famous uh, phrase uh, uttered by President Putin, which uh, it, is you, it is abused and, in my opinion, misquoted. Though uh, Putin hasn't, uh, in my, uh, no, to my knowledge, uh, tried to explain it, but he famously said that the greatest 
uh, geopolitical tragedy of the uh, uh, 20th, uh, uh, 20th uh, 21st century was uh, the uh, disappearance of the collapse of the Soviet Union. And pay attention, he speaks about the geopolitical uh, tragedy. He doesn't uh, say uh, that it was a tragedy uh, that the communist system collapsed, because uh, I have seen his uh, interviews, uh, but it was a long time ago uh, when he was very pro-European, I would say. Uh, uh, he uh, uh, spoke uh, of uh, Russia as a European uh, uh, country and uh, was not at all unhappy uh, 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 because of the disappearance, disappearance of the communist uh, system or rule in uh, uh, the uh, Soviet Union. Uh, uh, it was a geopolitical, uh, but maybe he had in mind that a lot of Russians, uh, ethnic Russians lived in uh, former uh, uh, Soviet republics, including in Estonia, Latvia, in Kazakhstan, and so on. And they remained uh, 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 then in these foreign countries. And often uh, they, they uh, uh, didn't even acquire a citizenship of um, uh, these countries. By the way, one of the reasons why I le left the foreign ministry of Estonia, I was at the head of the ministry during the coup d'etat attempt in 1991 uh, uh, in Moscow. Uh, 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 and uh, 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 the reason was uh, that I disagreed uh, with the policy of uh, leaving uh, about one third of the population without Estonian citizenship. And even more that uh, many of them then acquired Russian citizenship. This was not only, let's say, against human rights as a, uh, uh, as a human rights lawyer and member of, uh, former member of the U UN Human Rights uh, Committee. So I believe this was contrary to human rights as well. Uh, and But it was uh, even uh, for security reasons. I don't uh, know exactly how many, but probably there are in a small Estonia 1,300,000 uh, is the population. Uh, th there is something less than 100,000, but there are uh, Russian citizens living uh, there. They were even born, many of them were born uh, in uh, Estonia, but uh, they didn't acquire uh, Russian uh, Estonian citizenship. And this, this may be one of the security uh, threats, uh, mm -hmm. even at uh, these countries. Uh, 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 so, and it, it was contrary to uh, international uh, law uh, uh, too. So uh, now, uh, uh, to finish uh, this, I believe what is uh, underpinning uh, uh, the, the, such a sad uh, uh, state of international law is this absence of balance of power. I uh, I made uh, uh, I. Uh, said <laughs> when I was in St. Petersburg, uh, my speech was then in Russian, but I said something like that, that uh, arrogance and uh, recklessness of one superpower cannot be tamed by international law alone. The, here you need another superpower or a coalition of uh, powers in order uh, to face uh, uh, this one arrogant superpower. And uh, then international law may uh, have its, uh, let's say, civilizing uh, uh, and uh, 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 role. And I, I think we need to explain this for people who haven't studied international law, but maybe here it helps to have something in mind that uh, that Professor Stephen Neff from uh, Edinburgh University once said, which is that studying international law means studying how order uh, comes out of a system of chaos, how chaos produces order. Because 
uh, as people might think it is uh, counterintuitive that you need several great powers in order to have international law when usually you think great powers just do whatever they want. But that's not the point. International law then is the negotiation of these powers, of what is the rules of the game, and of all of the others, of what they accept as the norms that they are willing to follow. And over time, that then becomes a corpus of... Uh, commonly accepted uh, of common law of in of international law and what then even in uh, jurisprudence what you can use in order to, uh, to go to court or to go to arbitration courts and in that way international law is not the imposition of one or the other power but it is the structure of what everybody agrees what okay what are the norms that govern our interactions is that what you're thinking about Mostly, uh, yes, what everybody agrees uh, upon, uh, it, it is probably not exactly uh, so. Uh, it has always been uh, that some states have bigger influence on the development of international law. It has always been uh, so. Therefore, uh, I believe that this... Uh, uh, let's say, balance of power, which uh, was broken. Uh, it, it existed uh, since the Westphalian um, peace, uh, maybe, which ended the Thirty Years' War in uh, Europe, when uh, this idea uh, em emerged. And when, for example, it was broken by uh, Napoleon, uh, and uh, uh, there was no balance uh, at all, uh, th then emerges a kind of imperial system and imperial law uh, as well. And uh, in 1815, then in Vienna, during the Vienna Congress, uh, it was uh, written into uh, uh, the uh, Vienna documents, uh, the, uh, not only that the balanced factor uh, exists, uh, but it should be as a foundation of peace, no, not of law so much. The politicians uh, don't care so much about law, but uh, sometimes they care about peace especially after long um, uh, wars. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, this is uh, 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 the uh, situation. Now, uh, what emerged, uh, let's say, uh, uh, even the terminology uh, uh, changed uh, when the Soviet Union ceased to exist in the 1990s, instead of international law in the West, uh, there was a lot of talk about uh, 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 rules-based international order. So it was different uh, from international law because, you know, it, it is interesting that international law um, uh, consists of uh, different uh, principles which may, uh, uh, let's say, even uh, show uh, uh, ways of uh, two different uh, diverse directions. Uh, uh, and in 1965, one famous American international lawyer, Wolf, Wolfgang Friedman from Columbia University, he wrote that there are uh, principles of international law, which are principles of coexistence, principles of cooperation, and principles of integration, even uh, he referred to the emerging European uh, uh, economic integration uh, then. But in, interestingly, principles of uh, uh, coexistence, the, this uh, non-use of force, non-interference of uh, 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 to internal affairs, domestic affairs of state, uh, so sovereign equality of all states, so so respect for sovereignty of all states, big and small, let's say, or I would say that now authoritarian and democratic uh, as well, uh, and principles of cooperation as economic uh, integration, economic cooperation, and uh, especially human rights, rights of minorities, and, um, and so on, this part. What emerged in the 1990s, uh, uh, it is that this first part was considered maybe genuinely by uh, many, uh, including lawyers, as uh, unimportant. They were old, 
Westphalian principles. And now the new international order was coming into uh, being, and these were all based on these principles of cooperation. And therefore, widely used uh, so-called right to humanitarian intervention, uh, uh, interference in internal affairs of states, this was considered outdated. It is a bit funny now to see that the Americans are uh, complaining, or the West is complaining that Russia or in, uh, uh, China interfere, they interfere in uh, domestic affairs of democratic states. But they have flagrantly done it uh, 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 all the time. I remember in 1967, De Gaulle, the president of France, was in Montreal. He made a speech, uh, got carried away because he was so much welcomed by the Quebecois that he cried, uh, uh, shouted at the end of his speech, uh, speech Vive la Quebec Libre. And the relations between Canada and France were quite uh, frosty for several years uh, until uh, uh, de Gaulle was still uh, president. It was considered as flagrant interference in Canadian international affairs. You saw in Ukraine, in Maidan, how uh, Victoria Nuland uh, uh, spoke to uh, Jeffrey Pyatt, the, um, uh, the uh, ambassador of the US to Ukraine, and they decided the composition of the government uh, of uh, U Ukraine. Uh, John McCain supported, uh, participated in uh, the meeting uh, in my time. And may, may, by the way, uh, uh, to mention uh, in Georgia, uh, in the Republic, in the Caucasus, the uh, foreign minister of Estonia was uh, uh, taking, uh, they took part in a demonstration against the government. Right now, so, uh, two, three days ago, two days ago, yeah. I, it was a bit more like ago, probably, uh, before the uh, elections, uh, 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 yeah. Did yeah, it so yeah. again? It happened again in protests just a few days ago, like European yeah, parliamentarians yeah. in Georgia, yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and uh, uh, the uh, French president of Georgia <laughs> also. Uh, I haven't seen, it may be, I am not denying that uh, uh, Russia and China probably give uh, the taste of the same medicine to the Western countries, uh, to the medicine uh, to the Western countries um, uh, also uh, now. But I haven't seen such a flagrant uh, uh, re uh, disrespect of the principle of non-interference, as it is uh, in the case of now Georgia or in the case of uh, Ukraine. Can you imagine uh, uh, a Russian politician uh, going to Estonia and speaking, uh, uh, speaking about the uh, 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 Estonia joining Russia, not NATO, and, and so on? It, can't imagine. But if it comes from the West with good intentions, so to promote democracy, uh, as the president of Estonia said, uh, also that Georgians have the complete right to choose the European future, but not any other future, only European <laughs> future. I have, you know, I, I sometimes think that uh, they, uh, they take in, into account the, how the world is now uh, evolving. Uh, they want uh, too late to join uh, uh, the West. Uh, probably uh, it, it would be also better to uh, uh, take account uh, their own interest. And uh, this is uh, uh, working with China, with Russia, with other countries. This is this is where a lot of people also who understand that we are living through problematic times then accuse the West of double standards and say, OK, you you say that there's a set of rules, but the set of rules that you seem to support seems to only count in certain moments, seems only to be applicable in certain moments and in others not. And it seems to me that a lot of Western thinkers um kind of apply these different 
different principles to different times so that it is not the act that determines whether something is in their mind legal or legitimate. I mean, there's a difference between these terms and you pointed that out also in your, in your article, but it, whatever it is, it's not the act that determines the legitimacy of something under the international rules based order. It is the intention behind it. So when we do something, then it is it is fine because we do it for the best and the good of humanity. When Russia or China do do a very the same thing, then it is an a, a break of the international rules based order because they do it with the wrong intentions. So it is the 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 abse, absolute objective de, uh, definition or definitory power that the West claims that it has that determines the rightfulness of something and not the act. Is, it, is that the problem? Yeah, the, but this has been uh, uh, for a long time, uh, at least one of the trends in uh, Western legal thinking, especially American legal thinking. It is called the uh, uh, policy-oriented uh, approach to international uh, law which uh, means that you have to uh, uh, take into account purposes and ends uh, of your actions, N not, uh, let's say, what uh, rules uh, say exactly, but uh, uh, what are behind, where do the application of rules uh, leads. Uh, um, uh, but in that case, of course, it, it, it may be interpreted that if it uh, promotes democracy, uh, human rights, uh, then uh, the, uh, uh, such an interpretation of uh, principles of international law. And I would say that international law, uh, law is not so precise uh, like most domestic legal uh, systems. Or of th This is a, a result of compromises, negotiations, and there, there, therefore um, many uh, principles as, uh, and even norms of international law uh, leave quite a lot of room for interpretation. Uh, and uh, uh, I, I am used to that... Uh, 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 the, maybe the term, it is um, sometimes better to break uh, it than to bend it, because the bending uh, 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 is more uh, uh, maybe uh, uh, harmful to uh, international um, uh, 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 law. Uh, and uh, uh, if I may say, for example, most of the Violations of international law, starting from the 1990s, uh, uh, have been uh, uh, attempts uh, to make good things, to, ma uh, to uh, make uh, the world better, uh, 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 and uh, uh, to promote democracy and uh, human rights. Uh, so, they, but they, they, they have uh, all uh, led uh, to the violations of norms of uh, international law. If we take, uh, you, you mentioned also Kosovo. Uh, in 1999, uh, uh, NATO uh, used military force against Serbia. It was in violation of, uh, clear violation of international law. And uh, here comes uh, this, uh, maybe uh, the, the uh, famous distinction between legitimacy and leg legality. There was a, a commission sent up uh, which uh, 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 it, it was uh, mostly Western international uh, lawyers. And even then uh, they found that uh, it, it was unlawful. But they uh, 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 they wrote that, uh, but it was legitimate because it was to save uh, human uh, lives uh, and uh, protect uh, uh, human beings. And uh, so we can see uh, uh, the in invasion in uh, uh, Libya in two thousand eleven. Also, but it's an interesting. Uh, uh, case because uh, the uh, NATO's uh, intervention was based on uh, a resolution of the UN Security uh, Council. But the resolution was on 
the right to protect civilian lives, mm -hmm. not to change the regime and not to uh, fight together with, uh, to, to give uh, the air support for the rebels in the country, which uh, uh, led to the collapse uh, of uh, Libya. And similarly, uh, no Western uh, intervention uh, during this period after the end of the Cold War has made things better anywhere. So uh, if we take Libya, uh, Afghanistan, Iraq, 2003, and so on. It's just let me ask you here, because the West in, in 2022, when the full scale invasion of Ukraine started, and I use that expression because to me, the, the warfare started in 2014 when the sh shots started being fired, right? And the, the armed conflict started in 14, but in 2022, it became much larger. And then there was this huge outrage all across Western Europe and the United States that now Russia has broken with the post-Second World War uh, uh, or the post-Cold War um, uh, agreement that we do not change borders by force, we do not invade countries. This is a war, an imperial war of aggression. And we've seen this for the first time since the Second World War. And I thought to myself, these people are utterly forgetting about all of the other interventions that took place and the forceful regime changes and the forceful changes of uh, of also borders with Kosovo and so on that were not in agreement with the international law. But there seems to be this idea, again, that if we do it, it's okay, it's an intervention, it's not warfare, it's or it's maybe uh, even peacekeeping. But if, if somebody else does it, then it is a, a blatant infringement of the norms. And so the, the crime of Russia is not so much what it did, but that it did it. Oh, well, well said. Yeah, uh, I uh, certainly... To speak, to speak about the Russian invasion of Ukraine in 2002 uh, uh, as a brutal, uh, unprovoked aggression, it, it really makes me uh, very sad about uh, uh, all international law and uh, what I have done, uh, I devoted my uh, whole professional uh, life. Because what is un, uh, unprovoked, uh, what a provoked aggression is lawful. Has there, any, has there been any non-brutal, gentle, uh, gentle uh, let's say, bombardment of uh, Serbia? I halted to that. Yeah, there were uh, fewer casualties, of, of, of course. But imagine if China and Russia would have supported Serbia, like the West is supporting uh, uh, Ukraine. Now, the conflict would have uh, uh, probably taken the, as, as, uh, the same magnitude as the conflict in um, um, uh, uh, Ukraine, because it, it was this, uh, 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 this uh, so only Superpower with its allies uh, bombarding a small uh, country. There, there, therefore, you can, can say that it was not so brutal because there were no uh, uh, boots on the uh, ground. What I think about the war in uh, Ukraine particularly, of course it was provoked, as uh, the Pope uh, said and many others have uh, said. But that's not uh, enough. It was provoked by uh, um, um, uh, NATO uh, enlargement, uh, first of all, and then NATO uh, coming to, after, especially after 2014, NATO coming to um, uh, uh, Ukraine, uh, uh, not, not the Ukraine entering NATO, but uh, NATO coming to uh, Ukraine, the uh, factor, De facto, NATOization of uh, Ukraine uh, started. And you know, uh, I remember it was in 1963, uh, Dean Acheson, the former US Secretary of State, was asked 
about uh, the U.S. policy over the Cuban crisis. That the, the Soviet Union has started uh, establishing uh, uh, missiles with nuclear warheads on Cuba, on the territory of Cuba, completely in accordance with international law. No violation of international law here. Cuba, Fidel Castro was uh, for that, wholeheartedly, and the Soviet Union agreed, so what? And Dean Acheson was asked by students in 63 during the American Societies of, Society of International Law meeting, how is it, in, if you compare it with international law, the US actions? And Dean Acheson said that this, this is not a matter of international law. The very survival of the United States and prestige of the United States as a great power was under threat. And this, this is not a matter of international law. I remember, you know, uh, Russia could have said, or Putin could have said this when Ukraine uh, started the process of becoming a member of uh, NATO. In March 2014, Putin made a, a speech which is quite famous, and he uh, justified uh, the annexation or, uh, or reunification of uh, the Crimea uh, using historical, religious uh, factors uh, and so on. But for me as a non-Russian, but knowing the situation on the ground well, uh, also not only international law, his geopolitical joke was the real. Uh, uh, I am not saying that uh, for Putin uh, it was most important. I don't, he is Russian. I, I don't know what he uh, thinks exactly. But he made a joke uh, saying that uh, Amer which, uh, something like that. American Marines uh, generally are, are great guys, but he would prefer to invite them to Sebastopol instead of being invited by them. So... It means that if uh, Ukraine would have been in NATO, uh, in this uh, naval base in the Crimea, Sebastopol, there would have been a NATO's or American naval uh, base. And of course, it is like uh, Soviet missiles in Cuba. Uh, what is that Americans in Ukraine? So yeah. this, this is probably uh, uh, this, um, uh, 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 let's say, a political, uh, a political uh, explanation uh, of the uh, Russian response. Yes, and this is, I think, this today, at least in the realist uh, school of international relations, is actually well understood. I would, I would argue, even in the West, if we listen to people like uh, Mr. Miersheimer and Mr. Uh, Sachs and so on, uh, Professor Sachs. But um, we only have two minutes left. Um, overall, I think that international law is not at all coming to an end. Actually, the new multipolarity will rather strengthen it again. Do you agree with that? And within two minutes, can you just give us your final verdict of where international law stands today? Today, its uh, status is uh, not bright at all at the moment. Yes, uh, the uh, uh, new world uh, order, <laughs> still, this is more, rather disorder, uh, but, but from disorder emerges uh, a, a new order. And then, of course, uh, in a multipolar uh, world, exactly, uh, international law will have its place. I would uh, end maybe by uh, one quote, uh, Louis Henkin, whom I knew personally well also. Uh, he passed away already a decade ago, uh, probably, uh, from Columbia University. He wrote that most states uh, observe most norms of international law most of the times. And I believe he was certainly right. He wrote uh, this uh, at the end of the Cold War. 
I am not so sure that uh, this is right today, but maybe it is. But the problem is that some state violate some most important norms of international law too many times uh, and uh, neglect, uh, neglect it. Agreed. But that's what we keep an eye on and try to point it out when we see it. Uh, Professor Millerson, I will link your your articles and so on in the description of this video. Thank you very much for your time today. You're welcome.